Um, I'm not going to do much of the talking. Um, but my name's Steve. Um, this is my wife, Kirsten. Uh, we have a hard story to share. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to pray first. Uh, God, I thank you for your mercy and your love. In your presence in our lives. God, this is going to be hard, but we know that you are with us. You do not forsake us or leave us. I thank you for so many um, people who have shown us love and mercy in this time. Um, I just pray that you are. Me and Kirsten help us to uh, finish in a timely manner um, and to share what's going on. Okay, turn it. Yeah. All right. Um, speaking of negative emotions, I'm going to have a whole lot of them for you this morning. So if you're not comfortable with that, get comfortable because here we go. Um, I would say for the most part, we have a pretty good life. Um, I have a lovely husband, we have a home in South Seattle that we bought before everything went bonkers, so we actually could afford to buy a house six years ago. Um, Steve has a great job as a teacher in South Seattle, um, a lot of stability in his work. Um, he's good at what he does, he's very respected by his staff. Um, we have two healthy kids, Talia is five and a half, she's in kindergarten, um, Serafina is two and a half, um, she is a force to be reckoned with. Um, our life has definitely not been without struggle, um, but even in the struggle, we've always persevered and come out on the other side and kind of looked at that struggle and said, yeah, that wasn't so bad. We got through it. God got us through that. Um, but, you know, we have, we definitely had some things along the way um, after Polly was born. So I have type 1 diabetes, so pregnancy is never just a simple thing. Um, after Polly was born, uh, we found out we were pregnant, I don't know how many years later. Um, I had a miscarriage at 12 weeks, um, but God got us through that. It was okay. It was, a, it was a hard period of time, hard period in our lives because, um, yeah, miscarriage is it's hard and nobody talks about it. Um, and so I was also in a season where a lot of my friends were pregnant with their second kid. And so at 12 weeks, we discovered that we lost our second pregnancy. Um, then I got pregnant with Serafina, and that, for the most part, was an okay pregnancy. But then at 21 weeks, we found out that I was almost uh, going into labor. Um, they, the doctors looked at me and said, so you need to go to the hospital now. Um, your service is open, and it's possible, basically, that you could lose your baby. You're either going to need to deliver today, um, or we will sew your cervix shut. Uh, for the next basically 16 weeks. Um, and even in that struggle, we we overcame it. Serafina was born, she flew out of me 15 weeks later, sooner than she was supposed to come. Um, but she came, she was healthy. Um, it was a scary time in her lives, but she was healthy and everything was okay. Um, then in the fall of 2017, I found out I was pregnant again, uh, but that ended in miscarriage in about eight weeks. Um, but even even so, that was we were still okay. I was I was in general I was okay. Um, these were struggles, but but overall I was doing okay. Um, then uh, early October, I found out that I was pregnant, um, and things were very normal. Things were in the land of high risk pregnancy and diabetes. Normal is what you strive for. Normal is great. Um, but I was highly anxious about this pregnancy. I'd already lost two, um, and we wanted to add a third baby to our family. Um, and uh, I lost two, so I was just, I mean, you know, friends that are here, like they know the anxiety that I had. I feared the worst. I feared um, that we would lose this baby. Um, Things were going well, things were very normal. Uh, 14 weeks, because things were so normal, I had a cerclage, they sewed my cervix shut to make sure that this baby would stay in. 
um, until at least 36 weeks because of what happened with Serafina. This is a procedure that's more effective if you, um, sooner basically that you do it after you've established viability, after you know the baby's gonna be okay. Uh, they sew your cervix closed to hold the baby in there basically until uh, baby's full term. Um, so after that happened, everything was normal. I, uh, my anxiety started to, to go away. Um, I started to believe that we actually were gonna be having a baby uh, this summer. Um, but then on January 21st of this year, I uh, went in for a routine appointment. Um, and we found out that our baby had no heartbeat. Um, just a normal routine checkup. We got in there, I got in there, uh, Steve was home with the girls. And uh, the nurse couldn't find the heartbeat and they said, you know, she said, you'll, you'll just go back with the doctor um, and she'll, she'll just do a quick ultrasound and see and check on your baby and make sure everything's okay. Um, we went back to the ultrasound and I saw her lying there um, at the bottom of my uterus, just motionless. Um, crippling is a word that doesn't even begin to do with justice. So she turned to me and she didn't, the reason that the nurse could not find the heartbeat on the doctor was because there wasn't heartbeat. Um, I, I knew that as soon as she did the ultrasound, she was, she was looking so hard. She wanted to not tell me the news. Um, and I knew that the reason, or I knew what she was going to tell me, she turned to me and she said, I'm so sorry, there is no heartbeat. Okay, all right, I don't know what to do. So she said, go home, talk to your husband. You have two choices, basically. Um, you can either deliver your stillborn baby, um, or we can, for lack of a better word, we can basically scrape out your uterus and take her and all the other tissue out. Um, you can't do either one of those things. Nope. Um, so I talked to my husband, I talked to Steve, um, and I, you know, I just knew, um, I just knew that, um, that I had to choose to deliver our baby. Um, because I, I had to say goodbye to her. Um, we found that we were having another girl, our third girl. Um, and uh, so we decided that we, we decided that we were going to choose delivery. Um, so we went in um, to the hospital and I, you know, called them, told them what we were going to do. They said I had a couple days to decide while I went in that night. Um, and they. I, you know, she said, come on in. So what do you mean, come on in? Like, you're closing in a few minutes. Oh no, go into the, go into Swedish, go to the hospital where um, labor and delivery. I said, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go where I delivered my two daughters, my two living daughters, and I'm gonna go deliver my third baby who has died. Yep, that's what you're gonna do. Okay, well, I don't wanna do that, um, but I, I had no choice. So, um, so we got to, um, I, I delivered her early the next morning. Uh, we got to hold her um, and spend a little time with her with Angel Ruby. Um, and uh, then I think one of the hardest parts was we left her in the hospital room. And we went home without her baby. That's not fair. I'm not okay after four months. Um, it's still not okay. I haven't moved on, I haven't recovered. Um, I sure as heck haven't forgotten about this. Um, you know, and I'm wrestling with God right now, like Jacob did in uh, Genesis 32, I think it is. Um, you know, I know that God was powerful enough to change the circumstance to change the outcome of this, and he didn't. Um, I do still believe that God is good, um, but that doesn't negate what I've been through. 
Um, even though I do trust that God is a good God and a loving God, um, I don't. That doesn't change the way that I feel about my daughter who died. Um, that does not change um, <coughs> the sadness that I feel over this. Um, the thing that has become just pure oxygen to me is scripture. Um, I will have to say that I've never needed Jesus in a way that I have in my whole life. I've never actually needed to be Jesus like I do now in these last four months. Um, I, I mean, I know that scripture is true. There's a few that I want to read um, for you this morning. Um, I know that that the good, like, I know that God will use this for good. I do, I trust that, but it doesn't take away any of that pain that I feel that my daughter has died. Um, so I know, I know that God is still good. I know that he is still sovereign over all things. But even knowing that, it doesn't erase that hurt um, and the pain that we feel. Um, I know that scripture is true. Uh, Romans 8.18, where I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. You guys, that has to be true. If it's not, I can't do this. I actually physically cannot do this if that is not true. That this present suffering has got to be so much less than the glory that is to come. Um... Oh. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. I'm crushed. There is no other way to describe this. It is, it is gut-wrenching. Um, but the Lord has been here in a real way. Um, Psalm 23. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That is what he has been making me do for the last four months. Uh, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that is where I am right now. I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then finally, Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy is never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Um, they might be used up by 8.30 in the morning, but every morning they are new. Um, I will, my, my counselor is the one who told me that, because it's not my original saying, but, but it's true. I wake up and his mercies are new, um, and I trust that. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm still, um, I'm still not, I'm not okay. Like, what I'm learning is that grief is something that you learn to absorb. You don't, you don't get through grief. You don't, you don't get to the other side of it. You absorb it. Um, it becomes a part of you. And you learn how to function um, when you're carrying it. Um, some days it's really heavy. Some days I, um, I find that I, I struggle to do basic things. Um, the grief sometimes feels like a boulder around my neck, um, but I'm learning how to function with that boulder. Uh, a lot of you have helped me carry that. Um, a lot of you have been very gracious to us, have been supportive to us. Um, and I just, I have to choose to remember that God is sovereign, and I have to choose to believe that. Some days I don't want to believe that. Some days I feel really angry um, at the whole, the unfairness of all of this. Um, but I, I have to, I have to remember that God is still sovereign, um, and I have to choose to believe that even when I don't want to, even when I don't feel that. Okay. Yes.
be willing to come on down right over here. We'd love for, um, if you're part of their community group or you know them, let's uh, let's lay a hand on them and pray for them. If you guys want to come down, we just want to support you as a church family. And uh, if, if you want, just out of solidarity, uh, would you extend a hand as we pray for the crap family? Heavenly Father, we lift up Stephen Kirsten to you. God, I pray that as these folks come around them, Lord, I pray that they would feel your love for them in the tangible touch, the hugs, the support, the love of their church family. God, we love them so much. We mourn with them. We're brokenhearted. Lord, I pray, God, that in some small way, Lord, Today would be um, an experience of your love through your church community. Thank you for the bravery and their courage and their fearlessness in sharing their heart. Lord, may we follow their example. May we never be glib or light or shallow when this world is broken and we're broken. God, thank you that they led by example and help us to follow in their example. Lord, we pray that your spirit and your truth, God, God, that it would be the anchor in the midst of this storm that is in their life right now. Lord, I, I can't say it any better than Kirsten already expressed it. So God, we pray for your spirit to bring real, tangible comfort. Use us, their church family. Help us to mourn with those who mourn. Help us to come around and support them, to grieve with them, to sit with them, to practice the ministry of friends. God, we thank you for them. We love them so much. We pray that they would feel loved, that they would feel cared for, that they would feel supported. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So God, we need that word today, that life-giving word. We pray that your spirit would be in this place, working in our hearts, helping us to be teachable and receptive, comforting and bringing us peace. Holy Spirit, we welcome your ministry. Let us lay down any resistance of the flesh and let us hear a word from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, go ahead and open them to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations, if you're new with us this morning, is probably the most painful, horrific, depressing book in the whole Bible. It's not an easy read. It brings up all sorts of questions. It's hard. It's poetic. It's dense with metaphor. It's heavy. It's uncomfortable. It's dark. It's depressing. And it's really, really important because life can be heavy as well. And so the question that the uh, poet, the prophet, the author of Lamentations is rest, not wrestling with is, what do we do when God doesn't meet our expectations? Um, and it's not like going, like we had hoped, we had prayed, we had planned, we had expected. And um, as the Pratt shared, uh, their story is, 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 is utterly heartbreaking and, and one of, of many throughout church history. Um, thinking of... Uh, theologians and pastors, movement leaders and missionaries. Charles Spurgeon struggled with chronic depression. Or he was uh, preaching one time in a new venue, uh, being an evangelist, calling people to faith in Jesus. Somebody yelled fire, and then the stampede to get out, uh, multiple people were killed. And he was brokenhearted and bared that with him the rest of his life, never able to really work through it. Martin Luther felt almost constant spiritual attack. Moses didn't want to lead at all. Amy Carmichael uh, dealt with chronic pain. Elizabeth Elliot lost her first husband who was killed as a missionary. Her second died of cancer. Johnny Erickson taught a famous author and speaker, suffered a diving accident, 
was unable to, uh, became quadriplegic and now was just recently diagnosed with cancer. So this world is broken and we who put our faith in Jesus and follow after him experience that brokenness as much as everyone else. Our leaders experience brokenness. 16,000 pastors quit the ministry every month. Stress, burnout, politics, gossip, division. 70% of church leaders acknowledge a strong sense that God has called them into ministry, but uh, only 50% continue to say that after two years. So very practically, as Stephen Kirsten was sharing up here, um, they, they help lead and give vision movement to this church. Please be praying for your leaders. Be praying for us. Be praying for that. Why is there so much difficulty in this world? Um, it is a, a, a question that theologians and scholars and poets and artists and we ourselves have wrestled with. And it's a question that we will see now the author of Lamentations struggling with. And we remember, if you're new with us today, Lamentations is a book of poems. There's five poems. We're going to be in the third one, which is the crescendo, the middle, the high point, the mountaintop. And what we see is that this poet is not so much, he's not providing deep analysis of the problem of suffering. Rather, he's providing honest expression within the problem of suffering. And so these poems are written in 586 BC, which means absolutely nothing to us modern folk, but it would be the equivalent of saying September 11th. This is heartbreaking. Jerusalem has been wiped out. The people have been exiled. The temple has been destroyed. Anything that made you God's people, your identity, what was sacred to you, your ancestral homeland, your family, your language, your diet, your culture, all of it removed. And so we see that Lamentations is written as a way of processing that deep pain. Chapter 1, we went through and we talked about crying out in our grief. We talked about how God gave us this language of lament, that we don't run from Him, we run to Him, we express how we feel. We're whole people, even in the midst of our suffering. Chapter 2, we talked about the dark night of the soul, that God is both a God of justice and mercy. And He brought about His justice on those who have rebelled against Him. And now we go into chapter 3. And chapter 3 is a little bit different than all the other poems in the book. And so if you think of Lamentations, you can think of it like a mountain. And chapter 3 is the top. Chapter 1 is the bottom. Chapter 5 is the bottom. Chapter 3 is the top. This is the good point, right? This is the point that if you grew up in church and you know a little bit about it, these are the only verses that anybody knows in the book of Lamentations. And chapter 3 is a little bit different because the rest of the poems were acrostics. So they were the Hebrew alphabet, which is 22 letters. For us, this would be the English alphabet. It would be like A, B, C, and each of the lines started with a letter. What we see here is um, in a literary style to draw attention to this point, which is why this is so important. The author is saying, this is where we need to focus in this book. And what we see is every other uh, poem is 22, using the 22 letters of the alphabet. This is 66. This is triple the amount. This is to draw our attention. And so this would be A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 and it goes through like that in this poem. He's bringing our attention. This is, as one commentator said, an island of hope and an ocean of despair. This is the apex, the focus, the center of the book. This is where all the emotions being channeled go. And so I want to lay out, uh, we're going to work through um, this, this section, and I want to lay it out for you. Basically, there's kind of two points. One, be honest with God in the midst of suffering. And the poet is going to do that. He's going to talk about how he feels lost and trapped and torn up and hopeless. And then we see this juxtaposition, this change, this but that just shifts our whole mindset, mentality, thoughts, emotions, and focus. And that's point number two, find hope in the midst of suffering by remembering, the poet remembers, God's covenantal love, God's good providence, God's fatherly discipline in the midst of his suffering. And so um, some of us have felt, it's been interesting, we've been in this series for now three weeks, and some of us have gotten some good, healthy sort of pushback, like, why, why don't we do Romans? Why don't we do something else? This is really challenging. This is really frustrating. This is really difficult. This is really confusing. Is this really all that helpful? And... All, we believe all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. That includes lamentations. 
And the reason that I think this is so really valuable for us is that where there's smoke, there's fire. For many of us, we want to only deal with the smoke in our lives. We want to only deal with what we're experiencing, but we don't trace our emotions and work down into our beliefs themselves. And so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to get to our hard parts. And I'll pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 3. The lamenter, the poet, begins this poem by saying, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. That's a great summary of the entire book. But we're, if you've been with us throughout the series, notice this poem is altogether unique because we're moving from the poet was basically doing a funeral dirge for the whole nation to now we've moved from a public song to a personal journal entry. This is personal in its first person. I am the man. And notice, uh, under the rod of his wrath, I've seen this affliction. He's almost reversing Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. His rod and staff, they comfort me. Now his rod is disciplining him. And he goes on, he says, He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. You know what suffering feels like? That is such a poetic, beautiful encapsulation of what it feels like. How do I get out of this? My mind just keeps going over and over and over, and it's like being stuck in a dark room with no way out. Surely against me, he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. Verse 4, he's made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He's besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. Wow! Some of you who maybe are new with us today or are not familiar with the book of Lamentations, you might be thinking, is this the Bible? What am I, what are we reading here? What is this, right? This isn't, this isn't promises. What does this have to do with Jesus? I thought the book, you know, I thought they were laws. Like, this is just depressing. This is morbid. This is awful. And here's the truth. He made my flesh and my skin waste away. He's broken my bones. That's not going to be a verse you see printed on a coffee cup. <laughs> He's besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation, right? That's not bumper stickers that we're going to hand out after service. He's made me dwell in darkness like the dead, right? You're not going to see that on a Christian t-shirt or a keychain. <laughs> but here's the thing. Even though we're not going to probably commit these verses to memory, even though we might struggle with them, they're in the Bible. God chose to inspire an entire book of lament. Sometimes you need not just analyze your suffering, but you need to express it. And here's the truth. And this is why we don't like lament. Lament is not always accurate, but it is always honest. And God includes a whole book of lament because he is dignifying suffering. And if you're out there this morning, yes, our suffer suffering differs. Yes, it differs in extent. Yes, it differs in impact. Yes, it differs. But if you're out there suffering, I want you to know this is a word from the Lord for you today. It goes on, it says, He walled me in about me so that I cannot escape. He made my chains heavy. God is being pictured poetically as like a prison warden. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayers. He's blocked my way with blocks of stone. He's made my paths crooked. And what's interesting is we as a church body, as we live together as a family, and we love one another, what we'll find is that as people go through difficulty and heartache and heartbreak, we're going to have to relate to them. You don't get to avoid people who are going through a hard time as much as we try. And I get that feeling too. It's awkward. It's painful. What if I screw up? What if I say the wrong thing? I, I was caught by this phrase in verse 8. He says, though I call and cry for help, he shuts off my prayers. Right? Have you ever had that experience where you're praying, praying from the depths of your heart? It feels like everything's bouncing off the ceiling. Well, here's the challenge. We as believers who are living together in a family, whether you're in a community group or you're with somebody, and they say that, here's the tension that we have. The tension is when somebody says, oh, I feel like my, my prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. Well, God always listens and hears. I mean, you shouldn't think that. Well, that's dumb. That's wrong. That's a lie. You shouldn't believe that. You shouldn't think that. And that is true. But let me give you a way of relating to people who are suffering. It's a very simple acronym. Thank you, Doug Foreman, for uh, handing this to me. It's called SET. 
Sympathy, empathy, truth. Sympathy, empathy, truth. When somebody is hurting, when somebody's in pain, when somebody's suffering, and you want to love them, don't jump directly to truth. Sympathy first. This is how you relate to them. I'm sorry you're feeling that way. You're trying to draw yourself into their pain. Because the scripture says we're to mourn with those who mourn. Then we need to empathize. What in your life, maybe it's not equivalent, maybe you haven't gone through the exact same thing, but what in your life can you call to mind to draw yourself into that same sort of mindset? Sympathy, empathy, and then truth. How can you encourage them? What would you have wanted to hear? Do, do you maybe you need to not say anything and just sit with them in silence? Sometimes when you're relating to those who are suffering, that's the best thing you can do. And look at the poet goes even deeper and more vicious and violent with this imagery in verse 10. He says, he, that is God, is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. The poet is going as far as to say, it feels like God is after me, like he's hunting me, like he's mauling me, like he's ripping me to shreds. And here's a, a, a challenge as I was thinking through this. Could we create a church culture that the author of Lamentations could exist in? I'm not even just talking about feel comfortable. I mean like actually show up and exist in. Or would we drive this guy out and say that he is heartless and hopeless and not even a Christian? Verse 11, he turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He's made me desolate. He's bent his bow and set uh, me as a target for his arrows. God is after me. It feels like he's punishing me and attacking me. And here's the thing that I am so encouraged by in Lamentations. And I want to extend this to you. This poet is being forthright and honest. As we, as believers, now I'll speak very specifically, those of you who are in community groups, are you open and honest about what's going on in your life? Or when it comes to you and somebody asks you, you're like, hey, I'm fine. Here's what I'll tell you, nobody is fine. Nobody is ever fine. You might be in blessings, you might be in difficulties, you might be uncertain about, but you're not just fine. And for us to grow together as a family, we have to be able and willing to take those scary steps of being open and honest with others about how we feel. If you're a leader, if you lead a community group, you set the example, and it starts with you. What I do not want to hear is that groups have been going for months, years even, and people have not grown deeper together in that time. If that's the case, it is a waste. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to take the first step. And I know it's awkward. What fear keeps you from opening up? What if they think less of me? Here's what I'll tell you. If you open up about your own issues, they will know you more than if you just hit in the back. If you open up about your own issues, you're leading by example. If you open up about your own issues, your identity, you're experiencing that your identity is in Christ and not people's approval of you. Right? You can know a lot about God, but until you exercise that, and here's a very practical way you can exercise that. Is my identity in Christ? I don't know. Am I willing to be open with others about the ways I fall short? When we can share, when we can lament, when we can grieve together, it is a beautiful picture of the community that God is yearning to create in our church family. I wish my group was more open. Are you more open? Are you leading by example? Are you the first to share? Verse 13, he drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughing stock of all people. Now, the objects of their taunts all day long, they're mocking and ridiculing and making fun of him. He's filled me with bitterness. There is a, a sense that this poet is being so brutally honest. And quite honestly, we were talking earlier, and I'm really encouraged for those of you who grew up maybe uh, a lot like me. I was in a military family, right? And emotions were stupid and should be hated, right? Pain was weakness leaving your body, right? Emotions were just, were just completely dumb and should be denied utterly. And the, the scripture doesn't have that stoic stance. That evidently following God is the 
the greatest way of becoming fully human and becoming fully human is becoming spiritually and emotionally mature and it's recognizing, acknowledging, processing those uh, unpleasant emotions. If you have trouble doing that, I really recommend that you go to that workshop this coming Saturday. Because if you don't acknowledge your unpleasant emotions, here's what's happening. You ignore them, you deny them, and you stuff them. And this manifests itself in all sorts of ways. I've seen people who are just like, they're, they're workaholics. They have a compulsive need to stay busy all the time. And they don't think, well, hey, I'm not sinning. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm making it happen. I'm making money. I'm providing for my family. Yeah, but it's the motivation to do that is that you're running because if you slow down, all that stuff hits you. I've seen people lose family members. And they, instead of processing, they numb themselves. They go to the bottle. They go to drugs. They go to all sorts of things. And they become, in a, in, a, in a desperate attempt to try to medicate themselves, they ignore the issue and they become sort of half human. Always trying to push themselves away from that door that they dare not ever open because it feels like it would consume them. And I'm not saying you have to throw that door open. I'm not saying everything's going to be perfect or everything will change right away. But I'm saying if you ignore it, you're fundamentally cutting yourself off from what it means to you. And I believe that for many of you, the Holy Spirit is with you right now and wants you to begin to start opening that door and dealing with some of those unpleasant emotions. How do we do this? Well, first off, we need to tell people how we're feeling. Here's a, here's a practical one. Um, Wives, tell your husband what you need, right? They only have five senses, and uh, it doesn't matter how many years you've been married to them, they're probably not going to pick up on it. Here's the thing. Instead of being angry that they don't know how you feel and they can't read it because they're not intuitive, they are wanting to take the initiative. They love you, and if you're willing to open up and share with them, they will rise to the occasion. But will you share? Will you open up? This is practical on many different levels. Let's continue on. Here is what the, uh, the poet says. He said, he has turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrows. He drove into my kidney the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughing stock of all peoples. He's filled me with bitterness. He's made my teeth, this is so descriptive, grind on gravel. Oh. And he made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. This poet is being very, 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 very honest with how he feels. Is how he feels right? how he feels. That's how he feels. Remember, God meets us where we are, not where we pretend to be, or where we wish to be, or where we act like we are. He meets us where we are. And for many of us, we say things like, well, look, at I just buried the hatchet. I moved on. I checked out. I'm beyond that now. But what I would tell you is that if you have not dealt with it, Yes, you have delayed the momentary pain you would experience, but what happens is you leave that hatchet buried. Um, you leave that cut open and blistering and gross, and the infection will continue to spread. And you think, I don't want to, it's too painful to talk with that person. It's too painful to address that situation. It's too painful to acknowledge that loss. But here's the thing, if you do not acknowledge it, it goes deep into your heart and it begins to poison your soul so that you will start to say and think and act irrationally. You will start to hate people that you once loved. You'll start to ignore people who used to be your friends. You will start to find excuses when you used to try to find opportunities. What happens is if you don't acknowledge your hurt, you will become bitter, and bitterness is a disease and a diagnosis you will not receive from the doctor, but it has as much influence over your life as cancer or anything else. Some of us have the disease of bitterness, and it's because, like, um, like a painful wound that we have not addressed, it has become more and more infected. And yes, it hurts, but here's the thing. If you allow, if you let God in, and you let Christian community in, 
and you don't think you're right about everything, and you accept the painfulness of dealing with the issues, then you can actually experience healing. But if you ignore it, pretend like it's not there, deny it, minimize it, excuse it, and try and numb it, all you are doing is you're kicking the ball farther down the road, and that infection is going to get deeper and more disastrous. Do not allow bitterness to seep into your heart. He goes on, and here is where there's a shift in what the poet says. This is really very beautiful. Verses 19 through 21, he says, Remember my afflictions and my wandering, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. It's that, but this, all of a sudden the whole poem changes. You cannot control what you remember, but you can control what you call to mind. This is a deliberate act of the will in the midst of suffering. Hope is not found on accident. He has to, but this I call to mind. I'm bringing forward. I am taking the muscles of faith and I am lifting up the truth above my sorrows, above my current situation. I choose to believe this. Hope is not found on accident. Despair is not caused by pain and suffering, but hopelessness. And so he says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I will have hope. The great preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones um, talked about preaching to ourselves. He said one of our biggest problems is we just listen to ourselves too much, and we don't preach to ourselves. And uh, one of the uh, authors, uh, Paul Tripp, says, no one influences you more than you do, because no one talks to you more than you do. You are your own biggest influence. You are your own best friend. What you say to yourself means more than what anyone else does. You speak to yourself more than anyone else. So what is it that you speak to yourself? Lloyd-Jones says the problem is that we spend too much time listening to ourselves and not enough time preaching to ourselves. Don't feel your way into your beliefs. Believe your way into your feelings. Don't feel your way into your beliefs. Believe your way into your feelings. And some people will say, but then the, doesn't that make me a hypocrite if I'm suffering and I'm in pain, but then I claim I have hope? No, that makes you mature. Because that is what faith is. Faith is believing in what we don't see and it's trusting in the character of God and it's having a long-term vision. It's having an eternal vision. It's believing his promises despite our current circumstances. It's the rock that we stand on in the midst of the storm of our life. And he says, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. There are three things about God that encourage him in the ruins of the city when his life has been burned down. God's covenantal love, his good providence, and his fatherly discipline. Here's what he says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Mercy in the midst of mayhem. When your Bible uses the term the steadfast love of the Lord, it's linking in on a theme that is so incredibly important. Underline this, mark this up, remember this. Steadfast love is the Hebrew word has said. And it can be translated loyal, kindness, favor, grace, mercy. But what it's getting at is has said is a special love that God has for his unique people. This is a love that he gave to Abraham. This is a love that he gave to Israel. This is a love that he had for Jesus. And this is a love that he has for his people, you and I, the church, the new Israel. This is a covenantal, loyal love. This is a unique love. This is a family love. This is a love that's beyond just how we feel or just beyond affection. This is a, a not going anywhere. When you're at your ugliest, I will still be there for you, love. The Jesus Storybook Bible translated it this way. Uh, this is a never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love. This covenantal love was the love that was given to Abraham, the love given to David. This is God's covenant. He says the steadfast, the covenant, loyalty, and love of the Lord never ceases. God promised that through Abraham's seed, the whole world would be blessed. 
And this exile is the means by which he's going to accomplish that. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know that his has said, his loyal love will remain. And he is saying this in the midst of his deepest pain. This isn't a high point in his life. This is, as Kirsten was sharing with us, it has to be true. God's loyal love, working all things together for our good, has to be true. And that is what the poet clings to. He says, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I was um, sharing with my girls uh, one uh, morning. We, they have a, it's basically a seminary for breakfast. And we were talking about what's called the immutability of God. And so we drew little pictures, and I said, see, a person, they go from a baby to a kid to an adult to an old person, right? <laughs> and you know what, God, and then we talk about God, should we draw clouds, should we draw the symbol for the Trinity, should we not draw anything, right? Here's the thing about God, though. God never ages. What does it mean that his steadfast love, that his mercies are new every morning, that his faithfulness is great it means that he's trustworthy, that he's reliable, that he's unfailing, that he's unwavering, that he's constant, that he's steadfast, that he is immutable. He does not change. And the thing for those little girls that they haven't experienced yet that maybe some of us have is when someone says, hey, I'll be there for you, and they don't show up. When someone says, hey, I believe and I follow Jesus, and then they don't. When somebody says, you can trust me, and then you can't. When somebody breaks their vows, breaks their promise, changes their mind, ditches out. But our God is immutable. Our God is faithful. He never changes. He is holy and altogether different. When he says to Abraham and to David that he will bless, that he will establish a Messiah, that the Messiah will be a blessing to the whole world, he will accomplish it. He does not change his mind. He does not change his opinion. He is immutable. Verse 25, God's good providence also encourages the poet. It says this, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks after him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You never waste your time when you're waiting on God. Some people will say things like, you ask them the question, well, do you believe that God loves you? And everyone would say, sure, yeah, God loves me, right? But I need to get married, and I just got to find the first guy who you know, looks at me, right? But I need to basically do some things in my business that are going to leverage some money, even if they're not very ethical. I don't want to wait for God in this. And what's interesting is we say, well, do you believe God loves you? And everyone would say, yes. But does that love mean that he'll take care of you? Does that love mean that he'll provide for you? Does that love mean that he will meet your needs? Does that love mean that you can wait on him? You never waste your time waiting on God. And the only thing harder than waiting on God is wishing that you have waited on God. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Moses had to wait for 40 years out in the wilderness being a shepherd. Paul, when he was converted and uh, began to be trained up in the city of Antioch, scholars say he probably waited about 17 years before he was commissioned onto his missionary journeys. David was anointed as a king and went right back out to watch the sheep. And yet God is working in all of those things. It is good for us to wait. Do not run from the things that will humble you. Oftentimes, God causes us to wait for the things that we want. And if God isn't giving you the things that you want, why do you think that might be? If he loves you, it's because you either you don't need it, it's not good for you, or it's not the right time. But we can wait on the Lord. And here's something I would just tell to some of you. If you're going through a stage where you need to grow and you need to develop, you need to get clean of drugs or alcohol, you need to figure out what you believe about God and why you believe it, you need to grow in your own relationship, this might not be the best time to get into a romantic relationship. I'm not trying to hinder you, I'm just trying to give you wisdom. 
wait on the Lord at the right time. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. You never lose anything when you wait on God. If God says he loves you, he loves you. He's a father, and a good father says yes, no, or later. We can wait on God. And then, we can be humbled by God. Look what he says here. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him, and let him be filled with insults. Let him, let, let him sit alone in silence. See, what's interesting is that God often, when we say, like, how long is this going to last? And why do I have to go through this? God uses pain in our lives many times to make us into the people he intended us to be. A.W. Tozer says it this way, those God uses greatly, he often wounds deeply. John Piper talks about those who minister the best have gone through the seminary of suffering. Let him put his mouth in the dust, there may yet be hope. Here's the problem. When we're in the midst of suffering, we feel like we are omnipresent and omnipowerful and know exactly what God should do. And we're mad that he's not working according to our standards. There's an interesting story about a little kid who moved out from the country into the city. And the whole time he's driving out, he is whining and complaining. He's yelling at his parents. He hates his parents. He's mad, right, at his parents. He seems like this whole world is coming to an end. I can't believe we left our little house out in the country. And what's interesting, though, is that he is so nearsighted because he is a child and not a parent that he cannot imagine the new house they are going to, closer to his family, closer to his friends, with his own room. All he experiences is his limited knowledge in this moment, and this doesn't feel right to me. Here's the thing. There's a difference between kids and parents, right? I know this is Seattle, so I have to illustrate this. There's a difference between kids and parents, right? Kids don't know anything. That's why God gave them parents, and I know it's weird. He doesn't give us a license or any training, and you can just have a kid, right? But in good providence, an uh, adult should have a level of wisdom to raise their child, because they don't know what's best for them yet. They really don't. That's why. Uh, anyway. But if there's a difference between a kid and a parent, how much of a difference is there between us and God? If a parent can see what's good for a kid beyond what they can see, perhaps God can see what's good for us eternally beyond what we can see. And just like a child, we must trust in him. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and let him be filled with insults. It's interesting because there's this amazing story in 2 Samuel 16 where David is uh, getting a, a, basically accosted by this guy who's running and swearing at him, throwing rocks and everything. And his soldiers, his mighty men are like, hey, you want us to separate this guy from his head? Like, do you see what he's doing to you? Do you hear what he's saying? And David essentially says, God is using that man to humble me. Let him keep going. Sometimes, our sorrows and suffering, God has brought into our lives to humble us. And you might think, how dare he? Why on earth would he? But humbling makes us more compassionate, more teachable, more open, more relatable, more willing to follow him. Now, I'm not going to say that this thing happened because of this reason. I'm just trying to give you a broad scope of some of the reasons that suffering comes into our life. Final verses says, For the Lord will not cast off forever. For though he calls grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his ascent, his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men, meaning that things that you go through, and you think, and I love the way Kirsten said it was so good, if you go through heartache, God is good. He does not delight in the suffering of his people. Do you know that Jesus wept? It's the shortest verse in the Bible, and it's so powerful. Jesus wept. God does not delight in the suffering of his people. This is a remarkable revelation of the heart of God. God does not take any joy in disciplining his kids. I can remember when uh, Ellie was younger, she had to go in for a shot or get blood drawn or something, and I remember when the needle went in, she just let out this blood-curdling scream 
and was looking at me like, how could you, Dad? You utterly betrayed me. I was like, that's not, that's not baby, right? And that's a really feeble example, but the heart of God is not to punish, it's to lovingly correct for our own good. And so if you're frustrated because you've been making really foolish and sinful decisions for years, and all of a sudden your life exploded, and now you're having to humble yourself, here's what I would tell you. God is being so gracious to you. This is the most important thing that is happening in your life right now. Don't miss what he's doing. He doesn't delight in that your life has blown up, but he delights in your humility and that you're drawing near to him. That's the good that makes everything worth it. God is the good that makes it worth it. Here's a story to finish off. Thomas uh, Chris Holmes was born in 1866 in a log cabin in Kentucky. He grew up a young man working for a newspaper, and his dream and passion was to become a pastor. That's what he wanted to do. That was his drive. That was his excitement and his focus. That's what he talked about. That's what he prayed about. That's what he worked towards. He went to seminary, and he finally became a pastor in his mid-20s. And he was a pastor for only one year. The stresses of ministry, the heartaches of ministry, the sorrows of ministry um, paid an enormous price on his body. And he was diagnosed with a, a chronic illness and had to step out of the ministry after only one year. He ended up moving to New Jersey, uh, selling insurance for the rest of his life. And we know of Thomas because he very famously, in his 80s, penned a hymn that any of us sing even until today. And he was a man who, in many ways, probably would have struggled with feeling robbed from the dream that he had. Ended up living a very different life than he had hoped. And he pens this great hymn, which we will sing. I'll go ahead and invite the band up. It's called Great Is Thy Faithfulness. And in it, he reflects on this truth in Lamentations. And he says, morning by morning, your mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great faithfulness. So even in the midst of our suffering and our anxieties, Lord, this one thing we will bring to mind. That your loyal love never ceases. That love was purchased on the cross at the price of your son for the forgiveness of all who would repent and believe. And now we can be adopted as your people and your chesed can mark us so that in good times or hard times we can say great is your faithfulness because you have never abandoned us. You will never leave us or forsake us. And you are good to those who wait on you. In Jesus' name we pray.